Hello and welcome to this week's Property Matters, the show that brings global trends to an Irish audience to help shape your knowledge of the industry. You can contact us on Twitter at iPropertyRadio or by email at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your hosts today are myself, Brian Fox, and a special guest this evening, Emma Hayes. Thank you, Brian. We have an exciting lineup of guests in studio with us today. But first, let's look at some of the big property stories of the past week. We'll start off with second-hand property prices in Dublin have decreased by an average of 4,500 in the past three months, a survey has found. The Real Estate Alliance survey found that the average house price for a three-bed semi-detached house in Dublin stands at 433,000 for the second quarter of 2019. This is something we'll be covering in the political piece with yourself, Brian. This is the second consecutive quarter fall, minus 1%, since the end of March and a 2.2% decrease compared to June 2018. The average semi-detached house nationally now costs 236000 a rise of 0.05% on the Q1 2019 figure of 2 135,898 And homes are now unaffordable in half, in half of the counties in, in the state. Apparently so, yeah. And we had another one here saying that Wicklow, Meath and Kildare, the most unaffordable counties for first-time buyers, Leitrim, Waterford, Sligo, Cavan and Longford were the most affordable counties. Mm. Not surprised with, because Abs- I'm in Kildare anyway, as you know. Okay. <laughs> Housing first services to be rolled out in Wicklow, Meath and Kildare for the first time. And a development of more than 200 co-living units in Tala has been refused planning permission by an onboard Planala. The co-living model provides an ensuite bedrooms with shared communal living areas and is similar to student accommodation but aimed at working professionals. Ba- Batra, Bartra Capital applied to build 222 co-living units and 150 apartments at Cookstown Industrial Estate. It was the first application for a co-living development to be considered by the board. The company had proposed to build 40 co-living units on each floor with a kitchen living area, cinema and library for residents to use. In refusing the application, Onblower Panola said that the co-living format would fail to provide an accessible living environment, highlighting what it called a notable shortfall in the provision of sufficient communal faci- facilities. Co-living was, the only, was only recently included in planning regulations and caused significant controversy last month when Housing Minister Owen Murphy said the prospect could be exciting for residents. Indeed, and only 26 sites have been told to pay vacant site levy in Dublin City so far this year. Yep. So there are the headlines and as yep. we approach the summer recess in the Doyle there is no property legislation to be debated but there uh, there was a very interesting exchange this afternoon at leaders questions between the co-leader of the uh, Social Democrats Catherine Murphy and the Taoiseach regarding uh, rent freeze and acquisition of, of land for property development so let's have a listen Thank you uh, Taoiseach Today, all the focus will be on the two budget options and whether or not the government will opt for a budget A or a budget B in the autumn. But irrespective of which budget is presented, uh, the overriding consideration should be uh, that we, can, we simply cannot uh, afford any more wasteful spending as a result of particularly poor economic decisions. Unfortunately, those disastrous economic decisions continue to happen. It's not news anymore that we're in the grip of a housing emergency. Uh, Yet we continue to have one of the most expensive housing delivery systems in the world. Today's Irish Times uh, tells us that the latest economic report which shows that over half of 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 the country is unaffordable for the average house buyer. Uh, The most uh, recent daft report into the private rental sector showed that there was only 2,700 properties available nationally. The average cost of renting property in Dublin now exceeds €2,000 a month. That's the 31st uh, quarter in a row that there's been an increase. And the average rents nationally are 8% higher than they were this time last year. Minister Owen Murphy recently described his plans for the expense of co-living spaces uh, measuring just uh, 16.5 square metres as exciting and suggested that younger people should be willing to uh, make sacrifices. Well, Taoiseach, I'm sure you will be aware by now that on board Planola have refused planning permission for such a co-living development on the basis that it would fail to provide an acceptable living environment. With serious concerns from a serious number, uh, a number of, serious, of sources about the unsustainability of the HAP system, estimated to cost around two billion over the next few years, and figures showing that the government preferred turnkey option, uh, costing seventy thousand per unit more than a new build. 
It's not a stretch to say that this government's housing policy is an eco economic and social shambles. Recently, the Public Accounts Committee learned that a hotel room for one year to accommodate a typical homeless family will cost the state 67,000 a year compared to the average cost of servicing a mortgage or a rental. Obviously, there's a serious uh, disparity there. Taoiseach, how can you stand over such economic madness? And that's before you take into the account the social consequences of such economic policies, particularly on children. But Taoiseach, it's clear that, that it's, it's clear that the dysfunctional economic approach is working for some. Indeed, one of the biggest vulture fund uh, managing groups in the world, Link Capital, has said that Ireland is the gift that keeps on giving when referring to the level of distressed mortgages and the fact that, that, that it makes 62% of its annual revenue from the, the heartache of Irish homeowners in distress. Government inaction on rentals, on distressed mortgages, on vulture funds and most housing issues have simply been adding to the problem. My questions are, will you commit to uh, legislating to end the special tax benefits to REITs and using legislation to ensure that Thank we're you, not Deputy. allowed to dominate our private rent rental sector? And will you commit to an immediate rent freeze in order to immediately protect those at risk of losing their rented homes when the next rent hike inevitably comes? Thank you, uh, Tisha. Uh, thanks, Deputy. Um, any decision on changing the tax treatment of, of REITs is, is a matter for the budget uh, and all uh, proposals for the budget will be considered between now uh, and decisions being made uh, in October and it's um, uh, always the case that we regularly review uh, tax incentives and tax uh, expenditures in the advance uh, of a budget. In relation to, to rent freeze, um, uh, we, we'd certainly do it if we thought it would work, um, but we don't think it would work. Uh, we think it would be counterproductive. Uh, and one of the um, biggest problems that we have uh, um, is the large number of uh, people who are leaving uh, the rented sector. Uh, and even opposition uh, members have highlighted uh, the very large number uh, of people who were renting out a house or, or a property uh, who are now deciding uh, to sell it on, uh, who are leaving uh, the, the, the rental market. Uh, and that is a real problem, uh, because if there are fewer uh, properties available for rent, um, then that inevitably makes it harder for people to um, uh, find places to rent. Uh, so you may find that a rent freeze would result in more and more uh, people deciding to sell the house or apartment that they were renting out. Uh, and while rents might be frozen, um, lots of people wouldn't be able to find anywhere at all. Uh, you could see an increase in homelessness as a consequence of it. Uh, and none of us would want to see that. Uh, we think what we've developed, which is rent pressure zones, uh, increases of no more than 4%, uh, is a better response. Uh, because at least that way it, way it allows new properties to come into the rental market uh, and doesn't leave people with nowhere to rent. Now, rent freezes might work for the people whose rent is frozen, but for people who have nowhere to rent or need to move, um, they would probably find themselves more likely to be homeless, uh, and therefore that would be uh, a counterproductive uh, policy in our view. Uh, when it comes to affordability, uh, this is a real issue. Uh, many parts of the country, not least uh, in the Dublin area, um, we did see interesting numbers, uh, which you probably saw uh, only in the last week or two, uh, showing that the average price of a SEMI-D uh, in, um, in Galway and Limerick was around €200,000, about €150,000 in Waterford, uh, and even less than €100,000 in some rural counties. Uh, but of course, the picture in other parts of the country, uh, in Dublin, uh, is, is, is very different. Um, but the affordability uh, index that you mentioned in your contribution uh, is based on the price of the median house uh, in each county. And generally speaking, if somebody's buying their first home, uh, they don't buy the median house. They buy a house that's uh, an entry-level house. Um, and, and so you, I don't think using the median uh, is appropriate uh, in, in assessing affordability uh, in that regard. It certainly doesn't tell the full story. Very few people buy the average house or the median house. And most people buying for the first time uh, tend to buy a first-time buyer um, or a starter home. Uh, in relation to Onboard Planola, uh, I welcome the fact that Onboard Planola has refused planning permission for that particular uh, co-living development in Cookstown near Talla. Um, the reason why there are guidelines around co-living is to make sure that inappropriate developments don't get planning permission. And just as there are apartment buildings and housing estates uh, that don't get planning permission, uh, some co-living developments won't and should not get planning permission uh, because the kind of proposal that we saw that was that was proposed there is not what was ever intended. Thank you, uh, and uh, the guidelines uh, make that clear, which is why they refused. 
Deputy Murphy. Um, part of the non-availability of rented accommodation is because of um, what has been referred to just a few minutes ago, uh, the, the predominance of Airbnb, um, where formerly houses that were formerly rented um, are now being occupied by, uh, by, by people on, on that basis. Um, the report actually on house prices in, recently in Dublin showed that the, the average price of a three-bedroom house is 433,000. So that's many multiples of the, the, average, uh, the average household or average industrial income. Um, the, the, uh, Rebuilding Ireland has missed its target on uh, three successive years. Um, it's not, it was never ambitious enough to begin with. Um, and at the heart of our uh, unaffordable housing is the cost of building land. Um, and if we, for example, require a, um, if we require a constitutional amendment to that, um, uh, to, to address the issue in terms of the social good, would you be willing uh, to consider such a, um, such a, a referendum? Um, always, always willing to consider uh, proposals, um, either legislative proposals or proposals to amend our constitution. But we always need to be careful uh, when we amend our constitution that we actually uh, understand what the consequences uh, would be uh, and how it would actually work. Um, and if somebody, as a consequence of that, uh, found that their land was significantly devalued, uh, would the taxpayer then have to pay compensation, for example? Uh, all those types of things would have to be considered. Would it only apply to land um, that gets owned in the future? would only be prospective and therefore it wouldn't have an effect or be of any value for many years ahead. But they're the kind of things that would have to be teased out. Uh, you'd need to know the wording uh, and you'd need to consider uh, in full how it might be interpreted by the courts and what the unintended consequences might be. So there you are. That's an, it was an exchange there between the co-leader of the Social Democrats, Catherine Murphy, and the Taoiseach. And um, I thought it was very interesting because I thought um, the um, Catherine Murphy was kind of brave it put into the Taoiseach uh, to have a, to have an amendment to the constitution, uh, from the point of view of um, acquiring land, citing yeah. the fact that she felt that rebuilding Ireland is hasn't hasn't lived up it's to its purpose its at all. You know? And it probably has. Like the facts are there. It's the last three years they've missed their target. Um, I think this problem of people leaving the rented sector is a huge problem. Um, large number of rented properties are being sold and. Um, just in my opinion, it depends where you live. Obviously, the rent pressure zones are worse, but like we have situations where people are trying to view houses with 50 or 60 other people wanting to view them in rent pressure zones. So there, there's a lot of work to be done. And if we look at the, the prices, the overall prices of houses with Dublin being 433, they're saying 1,000. We're yeah. looking at Limerick being 200,000. We've got a few. There's definitely a lot of work to be done still within the whole rebuilding Ireland. I thought you had some good reasons too for avoiding a rent freeze because of the fact that it'll uh, it'll keep other people out of the rental market then completely as well. You yeah, know? I suppose that's a fair point as well. I'm I suppose it, there's it's never going to be a it's never going to be a quick solution, no. is it? And I think that's the issue with the isn't it? We have at the moment. And I think we're expecting a lot more. Obviously, we know that the homelessness figures at the last report were up again like so I think we we do want to see a lot of change, but it's just not happening quick enough and yeah. I think people are genuinely frustrated. We have families having to move towns and move from their their family places of living because of these situations because of the rentals and everything it's a huge knock-on effect and I don't think there's one solution there at all now that's just my I opinion. often question too the logic of the Airbnb legislation as well because I sometimes feel that's just being used uh, he was very good there both of them actually were very yeah. good there in, in making comparisons about the number of people number of the amount of money that could be spent um, on a house as opposed to the Airbnb situation, you know. Yeah. But Airbnb is more or less a tourist. Uh, I would have thought so, but are people, they're putting out their homes on Airbnb for non-tourists? Is it mostly tourists? It, well, probably, it would be. I think yeah, it probably tourists. would be, in fairness, but maybe for hen nights but again, and stags. He, he and gave, like the, he gave, he, I mean, she was quite adamant on, on, on throwing out, I think she said 43,000 in Dublin, whereas yeah. he came back with the actual fact that uh, the median is is, yeah. the, is the thing to go for, you know. For, yeah. For the medium, yeah, and she is right for for yeah. for, for, for to um, to get on the, uh, the starting ladder, you know. Yeah. But um, definitely, it it was a very interesting analogy that she drew between Airbnb and actually buying a house as opposed to renting as yeah. well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely <laughs> the two of them had fairly good, good points, points on yeah. both sides, and I think yeah. that's what the issue is. It, there doesn't seem to be one easy solution on both sides. Everyone wants the best 
we do want to get more houses. But what and of course she, she put this question to him when when Ed actually he's, he's I think he's on his feet now in the door. Yeah. Uh, the Minister of Finance uh, passed it uh, with his uh, summary economic statement, which is going to be interesting too from the point of view he's hedging his bets too on on, on yeah. uh, what's happening in the UK with the, with Brexit situation and so mm, forth as well, another. which obviously will affect pressure. But you've got uh, some report as well, haven't you? I have. I've got a bit of a report from the owners management companies. There's a report um, late last week, actually. It was launched late last week by uh, Cluid Housing and the Housing Agency. The report was commissioned by Cluid Housing, as I mentioned, and the Housing Agency. It was researched and authored by Paul Mooney to determine the performance of OMCs. Um, for anyone that's not aware, OMCs are owners management companies. Um, so I'm just going to use OMCs because it's short. But um, amongst some of the report's findings and research were that apartment living has increased in the last few years. And according to the report, the number of apartments in Ireland has increased by 85% between 2002 and 2016. Um, Further figures showed that 20% of apartments across the country are owner-occupied and that only 7.3% of the Irish population live in apartments, compared to the EU average of 41.8%, which I found... Like usually surprising where, you know, even compared to the UK and to Finland, I think it was 7.3% of the the population live in apartments in Ireland compared to the EU average of 41.8. And owner-occupied, what did you say? Owner-occupied, yeah. Yeah. Our own occupied, yeah. yeah. Almost 80% of the apartments in Ireland are rented with approximately 20% social and nearly 60% 60%, being uh, rented privately. Um, Latest figures from the 2016 census show that there are 200,000 apartments in Ireland. The idea of this report was really just to show, to provide sustainable apartment living. Um, so they they went on to the report to sh- say about how it's continue uh, apartment living is continuing to be a standard feature of accommodation options going forward mm-hmm. and managed estates will also feature heavily. To deliver the housing in line with the government's Project Ireland 2040 initiative, apartment building will need to be included in this in the ambitious plans. The report says 90,000 extra apartments will be required in Dublin to meet population growth demand in the next 20 years. According to the CSO 2017, in 2016, the number of apartments overtook the number of houses for the first time. And as the report states by Ronan Lyons of Trinity College Dublin stated that Ireland will need almost two million apartments over the next half century. Uh, Currently, 21.4% of Dublin's residential stock is apartments at the moment. Um, The report also examined the national planning framework and how they are expecting a population increase, as I mentioned, of 25% by 2040. To balance the jump in population, they're saying 50% of new housing needs to be provided. Dublin City must provide housing for 145,000 people by using land more effectively and developing in existing open spaces, open areas and spaces. it's, it's quite an extensive report and I would advise anyone to go on and actually read it from the actual website because it is actually very interesting. There's loads of findings and we could never cover them all here. But um, like in context, like Finland was reported as having 34.2% of their population living in apartments or flats. The report noted also that Finland is a country that is, according to the UN World Happiness Report, the happiest country on the globe. Even more interesting, I found, is that the housing model uh, Finland exercised with social print private rented accommodation and owner occupied reporting a good balance of living conditions people are generally happier in Finland currently Finland has reduced their homelessness figures thanks to Housing First you might be aware of that programme and 13% of people live in social housing compared to Ireland's figure of just 8.7% So the impression I'm getting from that then is that we need a bit of a, a jump and a bit of a goading to, to yeah. go towards um, uh, oh, yeah, or definitely. a nudge as Yeah as we Mr. definitely Brankar. do like um, I think a lot of the, the report went into like why people don't um, like apartment Probably living right. and stuff and why it's got a bad reputation most of the time it's because it's not managed properly or the areas aren't you know kept well and stuff and like overall management of the areas so what they're trying to do is recommend that we alter all this and that we transform it into a much better sustainable living and a happier living so that there can be more people living in them that aren't just yeah. say single professionals it's that we could be interesting how you, how you go about that in terms of educating and encouraging people yeah, to definitely. do that and know? they went into loads of data and research and they definitely did their homework on it and everything they went into looking across the water in the UK it currently has 14.3% of their population living in flats and apartments and um, it also went into like Green Grenfell and how building standards have been focused on with all the new homes and how they must be regulated better and um, overall the recommendations which there are quite a lot of is to offer guidance on all aspects of the operation of OMCs okay and then to re- maintain a register of OMCs. Um, I would just advise everyone just to go on and have a look at it. It really is quite interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, Emma, very right. interesting indeed. Stay tuned after the break. Uh, in the studio with us, we'll have Kevin Smith, uh, Chartered Structural Engineer with 10 years' experience in the London, Dublin and Middle East markets. 
Your community radio for South Dublin. This is Dublin South FM. And this is Property Matters here in Dublin South FM with Emma Hayes and myself, Brian Fox. You can contact us on Twitter at iPropertyRadio iPro- iPro- or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. So as mentioned before the break, our first guest today is Kevin Smith, Chartered Structural Engineer with 10 years experience in the London, Dublin and the Middle East markets. So Kevin, thanks for joining us in the studio this, mo- this evening. Thanks, Brian. Um, tell me, um, you say that we can achieve, since we were talking about apartments and so forth before the break, we can achieve a better urban environment under Project Ireland 2040 through placemaking principles, disruptive technologies, better land economics, quality, quality planning and, and architecture. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where should we start? <laughs> I suppose, um, yeah, there's, there's obviously there's a, there's a big, it's a big issue now, the housing crisis yeah. and that, and um, the, the market is very hot um, and, you know, there's a lot of problems arising which seem to be a repeat of the past. So um, just it's just in my background, um, I, I actually graduated in um, 2009 as a structural engineer from Bolton Street and it was one of the worst times in history to be a structural really? engineer. The recession yeah, yeah. Hit. With the recession, yes, you know, yes. so. I had a child during the recession, so I, oh, did, I, yeah. it's different, but I understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <Yeah. laughs> but we all remember very yes, well, you know, yes. so and it's hard for everybody and, yeah. you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, my friends would have would have either left the industry or had to go to find other other opportunities, or you know, emigrated to find work in construction. You know, wherever mm-hmm. I was kind of lifting first. Mm-hmm. So I, I ended up going to London, and you know, spent um, six seven years there, and you know, I moved to South London, and you know, at the time I was asking a lot of questions, you know, about yeah. what's the root causes of recessions and. But tell me, you and, went to and, London, and, right? Yeah, I mean. The, the global the recession was global so i mean yeah. what was the atmosphere like what was the what was the atmosphere like when you or the environment like when you went to london oh it was it was, it was uh it was in the doldrums, yeah. It was as well. The, it was at the bottom, yeah. But London, you know, it, it, people in London have a very much like keep calm, carry on, you know, attitude, okay. English attitude. Yeah. And, you know, they kind of, kind of came out of it first. Actually, mm-hmm. what, some of my fr- friends were thinking when China would come out first, would we go to China? Because that was like the East yeah. was rising and, all, and yeah. all that. So we had our all various strategies. Some of us went to Vancouver. Um, but you know I asked all these questions and so I did my own bit of research on, on it and you know the fundamental core you know that I came came, came with is a relationship between land and money okay. you know and uh, you know in y- y- the, the, the you know the economic system we live under today you know um, is driven by you know how the money system works and how our taxation system works so Mm -hmm. money goes in Mm -hmm. and taxation comes out Mm -hmm. so if you kind of focus on those issues you kind of you arrive at some interesting observations so that was my first sort of port of call on the subject you know Um, and um, what sort of observations would you draw from it? Well, like, so first of all, like, you know, how money is created, you know, it's, 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 you know, there's three types of uh, mo- money, you know, in the, in the financial system, there's commercial bank money, which is kind of all the QE into bank money. You know, uh, then there's, um, there is digital money, which is money created, uh, it, you see on your, your bank account or in the ATM, and then there's cash, and cash is created by the government debt free. Uh, and then, you know, digital money is created by banks, commercial banks, when they make a loan. And, you know, there's interest applied to that. So that sort of drives growth. You know, you need to have growth in order for the system to remain stable. Sure. When, when you know, there's about, in modern economies, about 97% of the money supply is created, you know, at source as debt. So that drives, you know, requirement for expansion and that. And then on the flip side, to take money out of the economy, what we're trying to do is we're trying to tax production mm. and people's labor and you know their, you know enterprise uh, business you know all gets taxed yeah. so that you know you uh, so um you know so i looked at that a lot and one of the you know ways you could rebalance the system in terms of you know uh taxation is is look at um you know land values mm. And I know when, like, there's a lot of work around the world uh, at the moment researching this. I think even, like, you know, World Bank, you know, has uh, studies on this. Ronan Lyons, you mentioned earlier on, has a... Trinity has a, College. Yeah, Trinity College. Yeah. He's big on it. Dr. Konstantin Gurdjieff 
and all that. But it's not a new idea. It's been around since the yeah. early 1800s. And can I ask, um, where did this come from? Have you always been this way, interested in this area? Or, you know, is it you, are you inquisitive? Do you have this 360 view that you want to know more about what's going on around you? In I, think, I, I think, I, making, I think, money yeah, there? I think, I think um, I, I like economics. Yeah. You know, okay. is, is, you know, and is it, it's kind of an interest of mine. You know, I think if I wasn't an engineer, I'd be interested in, you know, doing economics. Yeah. So um, it's actually like on my... Uh, application would have been, yeah. you know, engineering first and economics. So I have a natural interest in it. I yeah. always have, you know, how does a piece of fruit arrive yes. in a shop? Yeah. You know, and the chain, you know, chain associated with that. I'm being an engineer, I'm very much a yeah. problem solver. So I, I like to, to say, go. Are you kind of just now an engineer? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So I like to go to the core. And yeah. and because you're, you're not trained in eco- economics, you kind yeah. of maybe have a bit of a flexibility there to look at things I'm not saying it's perfect you're looking at things differently yeah yeah so, yeah and yeah. there's a lot of people there's not actually architects and engineers around the world that look at this sort of stuff you know yeah. um, there's a group in Ireland so would you see yourself as being different from that point of view of, of looking at the world in a different way to other engineers or other structural engineers no uh, no and I've, I actually I've, I've, I've met a lot of, I've met structural engineers and architects that are interested in this stuff right. because we're close to the you know, we're close to the coal face in terms of we un- we maybe, maybe in terms of understanding buildings and you know yeah. you're going through the cycle of the yeah. economic cycle, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. so that that's kind of at the core of it. I think there's some solutions in there about how you know money is created and also how how we we tax. So we need to move the tax system possibly towards you know rent seeking and you know land value increases. It's yeah. just housing, and it's not it, the Hong Kong system works yeah. on this. It's la- land leasing. Yeah. So okay. and uh, well, you know I, you know, we, we don't have to go too much into it, but you know it it actually you know promotes development. Right. Um, you know uh, encourages stimulates development on vacant land sites, and what's good about it is the free market takes over really. So you know you have a lot of planning guidance in Ireland, and you've got a lot of. You know, yeah. short-term fixes, legislation, yes. more, again, more legislation, more legislation, rent controls, yeah. rent controls put out the, the landlords, then, the you know, there's no landlords, so then you have another yes. solution. So there's a lot of bandages on a wound rather than treating, you know, the core of it. So would you change things then as current landscape? Hard I, question, I know. Well, the would problem, with land, what, value, the problem yeah. with land value taxation is the transition, yeah. you know, because, you know, the system, you know, it's, it's very difficult. In Hong Kong is a legacy the British Empire um, would have land leased to um, citizens there, and you know, and okay. when when that was handed over, that that's land leasing system maintained. So, you know, that's the the, the difficulty is the transition. But there's tax breaks and stuff associated with that that you can bring in and in bring in over time. Denmark has um, a form of you know site value taxation, land value tax, single tax, yeah. you name it, and basically tries to rebalance the, the property market so you know from uh, it's almost in, it's kind of complementary to placemaking because it's kind of like a bottom up yeah. poli- you know policy mm. it's like the land itself yeah. the, un, the undeveloped value of the land gets so, 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 so what's your attitude to Project Ireland 2440 are you mm. are you are you um, I think excited it, I, by it or, or? I, I think it's really good yeah. do you yeah yeah, yeah. well mm. we need long term strategic high level you know top down thinking you know yeah. and you know all the spatial planning strategies that you know associate with that but it just needs to be complemented i think with you know you know some sort of um you know the vacant tax levy you know could be just like the denmark model you know over mm-hmm. time and you know but it has to be explained to people you know to voters you know what what it means and the transition isn't easy and then you know place making you know yes. uh, i know carl is very big on yeah, on, on the whole engaged, subject yeah, yeah place engage and like all those public consultation yeah yeah yeah. Probably, yeah that's exactly it and yeah. i think you know there's a lot of questions under um, the national planning framework and all this policy about mm. you know apartments yeah and you know building medium density Yes. You know, and all that sort of stuff. And that's all great because you get more services yes. per, yeah. you know, per, per you know, pop, population, you know. Yeah. Like the broadband rollout is very difficult because we have, mm. you know, a yeah. lot of people in, in rural areas, that, you know, not connected, yeah, in, not connected in, in, in clusters, you know. In clusters, yeah. So it's quite good from yeah. t- t- things. So um, I think to just answer your question the national planning framework is brilliant you know it takes a long term view but we just need to kind of look at these other 
solutions yeah. as well. You know? And I'm interested to, obviously you came back from London and you came to Ireland yeah. then. When did you come to Ireland, back to Ireland? Uh, in, it was 2015, 2015, 2015 right, okay. I moved back. And, and the yeah. placemaking part of that, so like, tell me a bit about placemaking, your interest in it. and like. Well, like, well, when I when I moved to London, I, I was in I was living and wor- working in South London. I was, I was living in, um, or, or working in, in uh, Elephant and Castle. Oh, right. It was one of the last yeah. areas in central London to be uh, redeveloped. Um, and you know, throughout my time there, you could see the changes, subtle changes yes. coming in, and like, you're like, you know, the sense from, of a, place. from a from <laughs> yeah, 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 and from right. well, from an investment point of view as well, like it would have been a good, good time to go in there. Mm-hmm. And it's like I, I, I realized, you know, you know, my boss, you know, he was a uh, running a practice, working really hard, doing, you know, thing, but he almost made, you know. You know, by the time that I was there, he made almost as much money from just buying an apartment right. at the right time. You know, yeah. than from his, you know, from his business. So that land value increases yeah. as a result of you know, you know, master. There was a big master plan done up. You know, would have been community engagement, place making. You yeah. think you see little cafes pop up. Yes. You know, the, the landscape changes. Building communities oh, and building gen- 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 and it gentrification. creates gentrification. And then, and then, what happens then is that you're trying to solve a problem from local people. Yeah. Mm. But then those local people get priced out of the market, yeah. and they get pushed out. Yeah. You know, to zone five yeah, or six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, businesses all the rents go up. Yeah. And mm. it's a taxpayer in Wales that's getting. How, you know, how, that's, how do you see equalizing that? You know, well, the land value tax would help that, right. definitely. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you capture like a, like if you go in there as a local authority or government and you spend money on upgrading infrastructure, mm-hmm. there's an opportunity there to just capture a little slice of the pie, so that of that land the value increase to basically make that more economically viable, and that and also from a um, from a individual who buyer you know a person that's want to get on the property market market. You know, it suppresses, you know, extreme speculation, you know, in the property market because, you know, it suppresses house prices a little bit, but also brings on a lot more supply mm. because if there's an idle, like, oh, there's a, there's a, on, um, in Holborn, I remember walking past, you know, a lot of times, there's a, a lovely, there's like all these, like, three, four, five story buildings, and then there's a sl- slot of la- pl- plot of land in the middle of all that, mm. yeah, just a small plot of land, yeah. vacant. I think I've and, heard about this. Yeah, yes. and then there's there's a they're going they're going pumping in loads of money there yeah. for Crossrail, mm-hmm. billions, billions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that piece of land, you know, could have business on the ground floor. It could have, you know, you know. Yeah, but Kevin, isn't there a paradox there in that you're saying, um, you know, there's um, gentrification on one hand, and you're talking about the free market on the other, and then trying to keep the the integrity of a community as well. Where where is the balance there between the free market and and keeping the holding on to the whatever community you have within that gentrification well, like, well, you know, concept. Well, 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 the problem with land is it's fixed, it's fixed in supply. And um, uh, it's, you know, if you have a large portion of land, you can actually create a monopoly over time. So that, the, you know, and you could take it all out of production. You know, if this table is a plot of land and there's all the land there was, and I own half of it, you know, and I rented out that half, I get richer and richer. Mm-hmm. So I could buy more and more of the land. So more less and less people think. So because nature of land is fixed in supply, you have to find a way to rebalance it. And a lot of the ways that we do at the moment is sort of these top down approaches, social housing, mm-hmm. you know, where people fall out of middle class, they would be going into these, you know, so and then the the, the middle class is remaining is, you know, and even the wealthy people, you know, people who are you know, business owners and all that, yeah. we're all paying higher taxes. So, and landlords, it's not it's like, and, you know, people who are, you know, think that can still all happen, mm. but it's just a slice that pie rebalances it so that, you know, the person that does own the land makes the best use of it. Yeah. You know, and, you know, you know, and property owners, the best ones will do that, but we have to find a way to make best use of the land and stimulate you know, uh, and you, discouraged. You, but you, you're still involved with construction now as well, are you? As yes, a, as yeah. A, yeah. As a, as a, are you, you're in Dublin, are you? Yeah, I'm in Dublin. I work in the power sector, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I do, I do with projects in in, uh, in the Middle East and Ireland, um, just design design review and construction of, of large power plants, yeah. Right, and... Yeah, no, and you have big interest in BIM, I see. BIM. Yeah, yeah, BIM. Yeah, well, it's all, it's all these disruptive technologies. Yeah. BIM isn't 
super new, but the problem is the skills and getting the supply chain yeah. and that and all that together. So different levels of BIM. Yeah. And I think the, the government here in Ireland are trying to get level one BIM. So it's just a little bit more like intelligence all between right, okay. between different um, building modeling systems, you know. Yeah. So. Um, you know the 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 utopia in terms of disruptive technology would be you know if you could have you know a lot of geographic you know, these GIS systems yeah. you know geographic yeah. so you have you know intelligent understanding of what, what this is what planners are really good at yeah. to get all the data in there you know if you did have land values in there you could have that as a, a mm-hmm. policy tool yeah. you know if I put my road this way um, would how much people are affected how much money if you had a five percent land value tax or two percent or whatever would i would that be a positive externality boost the land values and i get that money back or would i do put the road over this way and you know and serves more population so that two percent would actually benefit the local authority or the, the government better and then it just so that's a policy tool. So that go on the GIS, and then you'd have you know you'd have the um, the BIM for the construction industry consultants who would design basically from like a master plan massing, you know studies, which would then you'd have your yeah. your augmented reality and your community engagement, yes. your place making, yeah. and bring the bottom 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 yeah. um, bottom uh, up approach to that influence the design so buy buy in from local stakeholders yeah and and then then the design team can you know our local authority or you know whatever can hand that off to developers build within the massing studies you know blah 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 and then you know they would get you know a citizen owned neighborhood and develop yes. it out you know yeah and and, 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 and that's you, the thing that you said developing out because it is about working on it considerably it's not about like place making is not about if it's not ever finished in terms of you have to continue on yeah, it's yeah. a, yeah, it yeah. a process as yeah, such. Absolutely, like, i think people yeah. kind of think that sometimes these pop-ups can just appear but it isn't yeah really like this kind of tokenism place making as yeah. far as like yeah. you know um what we we consulted and we went off yeah you know it's kind of it should be you know very I remember actually in Elfin Castle there was like a there's a like a community owned bicycle shop. And yeah. we used to go there. I used to, I used to be into the cycling and I'd go and I'd learn from somebody else how to how to you know, to, to repair my bike and then I teach someone else. Yeah. Like that at its kind of s- simple mm, level. Yeah, simple. It's sort of like a you know, create community interaction it. Yeah. But that space has to be provided. Yes, definitely. You know? So before yeah. you go and before we let you go what would you have to say about placemaking and stuff and what would you like to see happen I suppose in areas I think we need to um, we need to um, understand this um, a little bit better at you know at a kind of a top down level like a policy level um, it's a bit of a buzzword but you know mm. to actually start implementing yeah. at, mm. a, mm. at a at a grassroots level you know okay. community engagement yeah. community engagement yes. yeah it'd be great it's a key word isn't yeah, it absolutely yeah. <laughs> it is of course thanks Kevin that no, was <laughs> Kevin Smith that chartered structural engineer 10 years experience as I was saying in London, Dublin and the Middle East market thanks indeed for coming in um, Kevin very interesting indeed stay tuned because after the break we'll have Cav- Gavin Gallagher back with us once again from PropTech TV Everything's fine on 93.9 Dublin South FM. And this is Property Matters on Dublin South FM with Emma Hayes and myself, Brian Fox. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. So, as mentioned before the break, back in the studio again with us is Gavin Gallagher from PropTech TV. Gavin, good to see you again. Thanks very much, Brian. You're it's well, good to be back. I hope. Yes, very well. Very. We're going to talk about the Climate Action Plan, are we? Well, I just thought, yeah, it's uh, it was something that was in the papers there recently. Mm-hmm. And, Very um, much so. Yeah, yeah and and, uh, and, and for a good reason, I think. Mm. Yeah, uh, we're all guilty of, um, yeah, not ignoring. Being, yeah. Ignoring. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the thing we is, we live is, in our little ignorance. Yeah. I think there's a certain amount of that, and it's it's my own kids have actually got me very much focused on it, and yes. uh, and I was kind of shocked to find my my 13 year old daughter actually wanting to go in and give a lecture to um, to Google, actually of all oh, things, yes. and uh, during Google Green Week. Um, they actually had contacted me in East Point and said, is there anything we can do? And my daughter volunteered to go in and give a that's talk incredible. on waste. But that's brilliant, isn't it? This it's just showing thing. that children are now so aware. The next generation are going to be a lot more aware of the environment and the climate well, the than ourselves. Well, the thing is, is like, if you were to go on, um, some, there's some videos on YouTube that are go on about you know the danger of climate change and, and, yep. and the fact that only a couple of degrees difference will have catastrophic effects yep. on the planet. 
And I think a lot of people are complacent. It's like all these things. It's like you don't really worry about the fire, you mm. know, the fire guard not being on your fireplace until a lump of coal yeah. falls out onto your carpet and then suddenly you're Until something affects you, you don't really pay much this attention is it. to it. And, so. uh, and, I, mean, and I know that islands like the, the, the Maldives and stuff like that, they're looking at potentially being wiped out, uh, you yeah. know, just from... Yeah. From, from sea level, sea level rises. Yeah. So I do think this is something that's important from the point of view of it's not going to affect any of us until it suddenly affects all of us. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly we're going to be told that we have to make dramatic changes. Mm-hmm. And the sooner we start to tackle it, I think the less painful it will be. It's going to be painful. It's going to be probably politically dangerous as well because anyone who kind of suggests that cars can't enter into the city centre if they're diesel or petrol and stuff, mm. that's not going to be popular. Yeah. But it may be necessary because if you get to the stage where, you know, um, this just the amount of carbon being produced is, is yeah. more than the, is the planet can handle, you know. Yeah, so. and the carbon emissions are a problem. So I think we have to pay attention. So how does it affect the, the property industry is one of the things. And I yeah. mean, the fact is at the moment, if you're building houses, you're supposed to supply, you know, one or two electrical vehicle charging points for a small housing development. Mm-hmm. And I know we, we built some houses in um in Glenamuck Road uh, recently, I think there's about 28 units or something like that. And if I, if I, unless I'm, uh, unless I'm wrong, there's about two or three electrical charging points out of 28. Now, in a couple of years, in 10 years' time, mm-hmm. every single one of those houses will have to have an electrical charging point because mm-hmm. they're they're moving yes. towards electric only cars yeah. by 20. So this is going to be the future. Your daughter's done a great job on you. Have you, have you joined the Green <laughs> <Yes>. Party? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. It's it's oh, it's only when you start thinking. It's funny. I actually was I was thinking about, you know, legacy and things like that. Mm-hmm. And if you, you know, in in 20 years time or 30 years time, if this is a major problem, you know, for the world and, and it could well be, you might be looking upon, you know, your actions 20 years yes. ago in the same way that we would look upon say whaling. Yes. Um, today yeah. and uh, you know we look or even in we some cases smoking like the way sometimes we yeah. do that yeah. like I mean the fact like that you know you could yeah. sell you know the yeah. Marlboro Man and it was super cool and I mean yeah. my dad started smoking when he was like mm. eight or nine or something yeah. like that mm-hmm. and so nowadays yeah. you're a pariah you know you're a yeah. cigarette company you're terrible yeah. you're outside <laughs> you're judged by today's yeah. standards you yeah. know? do you think would developers adjust pretty quickly to the to the whole notion of what you've just been talking They're about going to have I'm not sure I'm not sure they will voluntarily I think that I mean there will be a couple of people there's a guy in in, in Holland called, I can't remember his name, but the company is called OVG. And they decided that this was a huge thing. And they decided to shift the entire company towards the kind of entirely green kind of agenda. And they went out and they all bought Toyota Prius cars and all this kind yeah. of stuff. So they, they kind of, he put his money where his mouth was, whereas, because he was a wealthy guy, he was capable of having, you know, the, the, the flashiest Mercedes and whatever, went and started doing this. And then they started building these buildings that were, completely sustainable I mean 100% sustainable and suddenly they've made a great name for themselves and they've created a brand that is now very very valuable yes. and they've built the I mean it's just been overtaken in uh, by Bloomberg's headquarters in London yeah. so Bloomberg uh, I was just there looking at the building a few weeks ago I saw you. and you saw my, yeah. my Instagram posts um, that is the most environmentally sustainable building ever built and it cost over a billion dollar or a billion pounds to build it mm. um, so yeah but at the same time it could be argued that the Bloomberg Corporation is a very wealthy organisation that's the thing and, uh, I mean they can afford yeah. to have an iconic kind mm-hmm. of you know mm-hmm. superstructure and, and like it, it does their portfolio very well as well it's true having said that you have to kind I wonder um, the, the guys that I mentioned in Holland I mean they had a building and Deloitte moved into that building right, yeah. and so it shows that I think a lot of the large companies mm. have this corporate social yes. responsibility so, yeah. no. and they're starting to kind of so I recently I mean in, in my putting my East Point hat on I recently mm. had a discussion with some of the tenants in there and people like Google and stuff they're very interested in the idea of anything that's environmentally yeah. friendly in the park so we're looking now at improving our recycling and our waste yeah. you know how we handle You're our being waste. responsible in yeah but I mean you have to I think you have to lead by you know well. yeah lead yeah. by example yeah. I mean there's no point waiting until someone's beating you with a stick mm-hmm. because then it's a dramatic change as yes. well mm-hmm. and you're kind of you know you're resisting it you're resisting it but is that the danger now with the legislation and the proposed pr- the proposals coming from government as well will there I, I don't want to get political <laughs> no no <laughs> but do, will there be a counter effect do you think with 
with people being mandated to do things. Well, I think they have to be, though, Brian. I, I, think, I, would, I don't I think there's any choice. Yeah, I really I don't think, think there's... I don't think... Be. I mean, you know, look at the way it was in supermarkets. I mean, everyone was taking a plastic bag and mm-hmm. you would just fill exactly. your plastic bags yeah. and all of a sudden it's 22 cent per plastic yeah. bag. And suddenly, I overnight, totally you're there saying, yeah. mm, I don't actually need yeah. 10 plastic bags. Yeah. I'll just take that one, you know, reusable Yeah, and one. I was at an event a couple of weeks ago and um, we had this discussion. It was actually at a local authority was there and a guy from the local authority and he said, how do we change people's mindset? And my, my call was cost because people will definitely if we get charged more for a cup of coffee because we have to get a takeaway cup paper disposable cup we will you know if the cost will, yes. it will impact us so therefore we will change our ways I don't know whether we'll change our ways on our own no we won't because people it, I mean the, oh, everyone so. says that they, they mean well uh, but yeah. usually it's I mean we've got a thousand things to do we all have a busy yes. life and are you thinking about you know going out and sorting your bin your waste yeah. and if Wait you remember it, it's, it's, how many, uh, it's only probably 10 15 years ago that we had free waste collection from Dublin City Corporation or whatever and you would just throw everything out into the bin you didn't think about it suddenly they're charging per weight how how quickly was it before we're all kind of segregating years ago and yeah. you know and that's what's actually really sad so I agree with you Gavin I have two girls um, there's, and they're very much on you know the climate is a big thing and I think it's great that kids are actually paying attention to this because they are the next generation and well, they'll important. be the ones trying to fix it and, and I it's mean, definitely for us to yeah. actually lead by example as you said like, well uh, you know the, the, your, um, the, the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio went on did this big speech at yes. the UN and it was very kind of inspiring speech mm-hmm. but he was saying you know are we going to be the generation that is vilified in the future as the guys yeah. that that sat back and, and just let this happen. Yeah, you know, what sort of nickname are we going to have in the future? This like, it's it. going to happen, like, you know? I mean, you, you know, you see people like Donald Trump, you know, pulling out of the Paris Accord and stuff, and that's a very unpopular move. Mm. And uh, But he, he, he kind of, like, seems to, you know, revel in this kind of unpopular moves and mm. stuff. Yes. Whereas the majority of people would, would be kind of saying, you've got a hundred and whatever, 75 countries that joined it. The only three that were not part of it one of them was North Korea and the other one was you know mm. America like, yeah. and then the other one was I think Venezuela and only because they thought it was too weak and that it needed to be stronger or something like that yeah. so it was um, you know I just think that if we don't do this with a stick uh, we're not going to change and then all of a sudden it'll become to the point where instead of having to do small changes you'll have to make massive changes that are extremely unpopular and So you want to see strong legislation in other words? Well I don't think it, it's not something necessarily I want but I think it's necessary I mean mm-hmm. and it's a I pain that we have to take yeah. I mean would you voluntarily give up your car and sort of move to, de- to, to an electrical Electric. vehicle mm. unless you were told you won't be able to use your electrical mm. vehicle. Mm. So suddenly everyone's going to start. I mean, scrapping the cars a few years ago, everyone was driving around in bangers until they started bringing in the scrapage yeah. scheme. So it there are carrots and purple. sticks mm. and ways of doing I mean, I saw that they're talking about the um, the houses, I mean, retrofitting your house yeah. Yeah. to yeah. bring it up. I mean, that it's is an expensive, standard. you know, it's not fair to go and say to somebody who's mm-hmm. been living, you know, who's at a certain age and can't afford this, yes. you suddenly have to spend all this money on your house. Mm. So you have to make it kind of viable for those people as well. Yeah. So I think there's a balance to be had. Mm. But I think a lot of people are just not going to give up their, you know. Yeah, I've had, um, I have a political problem here in the state as well. And I must say that the Green Party at this point in time seem to be fairly, uh, flexible in their thinking in relation to where they're at at the moment because they've had their hard times as well as you well know after, mm. after last but they seem to be in a place where they I mean it'll be interesting to see how this wave keeps going you know from that point of view um, because there, there, there certainly is a consciousness about where the, where the world is going at the moment and it's not good well, it, you just have to look at the, natu- the, the amount of natural disasters that have taken place. Yeah. You've got droughts in America. Mm-hmm. And in fact, an interesting one, I was just speaking um, recently um, with my East Point hat on. We had a, um, a talk about the, the sea level, the, the flood level over Dublin. Yeah. And when we be- built East Point 25 years ago, it was about one and a half metres below our ground level and they were saying recently that it's actually come up a significant amount in the last 25 years and something that I wasn't aware of because you don't look out and and kind of think that this Mm. is an issue Mm. but things are starting to take place and it's happened so slowly that it's imperceptible Mm. but suddenly you realise that Mm. um, God, you know things are not growing as quickly as they used to and suddenly we have you know we're an agricultural 
sort of, you know, country with yeah. a huge economy based around that. What if we suddenly find that our economy or our climate has changed mm -hmm. and we're now not getting the same amount of rainfall as we used to? And suddenly it's, you know, yeah. reducing. But changes have to be made, though, don't they? Yeah. It's particularly in Ireland, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of transport and, and all the rest. I mean, the I have, sorry. <coughs> sorry, no, I was just going to say that the problem is, is Ireland is so small. I mean, you have yes. to lead by example. Yeah. I mean, what we do... You know, we could all decide to kind of change and it mm -hmm. won't make a difference if, if China decides that they're not going to bother, you know. Yes. Having said that, I do think it's important that we are the ones that are out there. And, and bear in mind, too, that you've got to feel some sympathy too towards the developer who's um, building on a very tight budget um, entry level houses. You know. It is, yeah. And then, and I think things need to be done there. The government probably has to kind yeah. of give more tax allowances yeah. and things like that or some sort mm. of yeah, incentive. incentive. Yeah, because definitely. you can't just sort of keep on loading on the costs and expect the house prices to stay the same, you mm. know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, that's and the, car the proposed carbon tax too should be very interesting as well to see that, how that's administered. Yeah. Because again, and I don't know how they'll how they'll view it, but uh, from what I'm hearing from the Green Party, they want the revenue commissioners to collect it. You know, and I don't. Mm. I think the revenue commissioners are basically there for, for income tax. I don't think they were too happy to be taking on property taxes. You know? Well, apart from that, it's an <coughs> self-assessment that most of us are under. So, yeah. I mean, how does that work if you know somebody decides that they're not going to, you know, they're not going to add a big price onto their, unless they get caught, of course, you know. Yeah, I suppose it's going to be interesting to see how it progresses and how everything goes. But I do think you've got the right idea. All of us need to have, like, take some responsibility. You know, we don't want the generations ahead looking at us. Sort of yeah, going, what we were they the, up to? We were sleepwalking. <laughs> yeah. No more than we look at the, you know, the war, World War One, and how they all somehow yeah. ended up in the situation where, yeah. you know, fifty yeah. million people died or whatever, yeah. and they kind of slept walked into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know. I just think that there's going to be a point mm -hmm. in time where you cannot reverse the damage that's been done, and suddenly we'll all be waking up to it yeah. and going, oh, let's all do this now. It'll be too late, you know. Mm -hmm. So. And in terms of technology like that you're in, and prop tech that you're specifically in, will that aid or help the whole situation? Uh, well, I think it should help. I've been looking at some, I mean, there are guys out there that have got, um, uh, you know, is, is certainly in the energy sort of sector, mm -hmm. you've got apps now that allow you to have like a platform or a, a dashboard on your computer. So your, your building information mm -hmm. management yeah. is monitoring. I was in, um, I, w I got a tour of Oracle's latest building in East Point just a, a week ago. And they have uh, solar panels on the roof and, yes. they, and they heat up yeah. their water using mm. solar. Mm. And and then they had an emissions, they actually had a live screen inside their lobby area that said how much of the power in the building was being generated by renewables and stuff. So that's an important, I mean, the big companies are starting to take notice of yeah. this for sure. Mm. And I also think it's an essential part of their recruitment drive because yes. the young people that they're trying to hire are not going to work for somebody who they see as kind of morally bankrupt and, mm. and, and mm. people who don't care. Yeah. It's, all it's kind of seen room. as the same way as mental health and well-being now. I think it's kind of everything is like, it's not just about going to work anymore. It's about like, is your employer responsible, or, you know, yeah. in terms of like recycling? Are they going to give you the the balance of working, remote working, everything yeah. flexible working and that downtime, green spaces to sit in, relaxing areas, all that kind of stuff. I don't think it's as simple as... We have, um, we, we've just been looking at uh, additional bike racks in the park because since we built East Point, uh, there's a massive increase in the amount yeah. of people that are cycling every day. But reading the, the climate action plan, mm. they're, they're trying to massively increase that even further. Mm. And so and segregated as well. Yeah, I, I can see a point where, you know, lanes on roads will mm. be given over to, to entire cycle lanes. Because, mm. I mean, I, I've just been in, in London last week and um, there are entire lanes that used to be bus lanes that are now cycle lanes. Yeah. And then the bus lane has moved out and it's now taking over what was the traffic lane. I suppose that's what they hope to achieve here with Bus Connects, with the, with the lanes there, you know. That's it, yeah. Is I think it's feasible, necessary. I suppose, yeah. Like, well, if you, you have know, a look at, at, at Leeson Street Bridge, where mm. the where the cycle kind no, of highway yeah, thing yeah, is, yeah, yeah, the yeah, amount yeah, of traffic yeah. crossing yeah. that in the morning yeah. is incredible. And I don't think anyone predicted that yeah. was going to actually and take place. And from the point of the cycle lane as well, we just sort of throw put, put it there with a few white lines. You yeah, know? yeah. yeah. Which yeah. I, I feel sorry for any cyclists trying to cross there with the, with the I whole think, traffic. I think it's going to get to the point where you actually have to build a, an overpass for so the cyclists can <laughs> cycle yeah. over the. But I think I think the East Point Business Park has uh, and all that area around there has has got some very good bike. Uh, well, um, yes, lanes. And, yes and no. There are some Alfieburn Road has some good lanes, and what they're ta they're talking about a Sandyford to Sutton bike rack, no, uh, no, route no. that will take you all the way through, mm. and they're trying to kind of make the various connections. But there are parts of say Dublin Port 
where there are, where you can't actually you know cross the road without you know taking okay. your life in your hand. So there's a few areas that I think they need to look at, mm. and and I think there are plans being you know afoot to to look at that kind of stuff. Mm. But all of these things obviously cost money, mm. and to build a bridge mm. that crosses a road, yeah. you know, is not you know yeah. it's not overnight. You know. But sure, we'll get there. Especially, hopefully. Anyway, thanks very much, Gavin. That was Gavin Gallagher of PropTech TV. Thank you for joining us today, Gavin. That's it from us in the studio today. Thank you for joining us on Property Matters, the show where property matters. Get in touch with the show by emailing hello at iPropertyRadio.com or on Twitter at iPropertyRadio. And we want to thank all our guests for joining us here today. Also, thanks to Shane Flynn, who was on sound, and producer Katie, F- Katie Tallon. We're back at the same time next week. Stay tuned for Bowl of Soul, which is coming up next. For Emma Hayes and myself, Ryan Fox, have a good week.